ask, seek, knock, and God will answer prayer. That's an incredible promise of Jesus. And what he's saying is that God is not like family, friends, neighbors, colleagues who, when we ask for help, or is sometimes reluctant to help. No, God answers our prayer. And I know in my prayer life, and I'm sure most of us in our prayer lives know that God answers our prayer when we ask. Well, if that's so, Skip, why are there so many unanswered prayers? Why is it when I pray for my friend, he's getting worse? Why is it when I pray for my health, it's getting worse? Why is it when I pray for so-and-so, they died? Why is it when I pray for my marriage, it's ended up in a divorce? When I pray for my children, they've turned out worse? Why is it when I pray for a better job, I can't find one? What is it when I pray for my income, finances are not falling into place? Why is it that when I've prayed for things in life, such as school, and my grades just can't get any better? Why is it that when Jesus himself prayed, Lord, take this cup from me, he died anyway? Why are there so many unanswered prayers? Well, I'll give you four reasons. First of all, a lot of us don't pray. No prayer, no answer, it's as simple as that. Second reason, a lot of times when we pray, we don't pray, we just simply say words, like at meal times. I know a lot of people, when they say a prayer, they say a prayer, but they don't pray a blessing. Uh, or like the Lord's Prayer. A lot of times people just recite the Lord's Prayer and not really pray the Lord's Prayer. Now it's okay to have memorized prayers, such as the Serenity Prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and other prayers. It's okay as long as we pray them and just don't recite words. Because if all I do is stand here and say words, am I communicating with you? No. You see, prayer is not just saying words. Prayer is talking to God. It's communication. Now the third reason there's so many unanswered prayers is a lot of times when we pray, we do all the talking and we don't do any listening. Now if, if I were to come to you and say, I need your advice, I need your wisdom, what do you think about this, what do you think about, this? how can I solve this problem? And if I pour all these things out to you and then walk away before you've had a chance to respond, have, have we communicated? No. All I've done is unloaded on you. Now a lot of times we, we get at the altar or we go into the bathroom or get in the car, in the closet, in the bed, whatever, and we pour out our hearts to God. I mean, we let God know what's on our mind. We beg and plead for help. And then we say, in the name of Jesus Christ, our man, get up and go do something else. You see, prayer is not talking to God. Prayer is communication with God. In fact, I wish the word prayer didn't exist because if, if all we ever talked about was, let's talk to God, let's say what's on our mind, then we'd understand what prayer is. Prayer is dialogue, talking with God. Now, the fourth reason there seems to be so many unanswered prayers is a lot of times when we listen, we tend to listen to what we want to hear and not necessarily to what God's trying to say. I bet you know people like that. I bet you know of uh, your spouse, your children, your parents, in which you tell them the obvious, but they don't want to hear it. Well, sometimes God gives us the obvious answer, but we don't want to hear it. We don't want to see it. Now, that's what Jesus is getting to in today's scripture. Let's look at it a little careful, more closer. He says, ask and be given, seek and you'll find, knock and the door will be open. For everyone who asks receives, everyone who knocks, God will answer prayer. But notice the next word, the very next word, is a two-letter word, or. O-R, or. Or means there's more to the subject of what I'm talking about. Or means Jesus is going to say something else. Or means I'm going to clarify how I'm going to answer prayer. Now what did he say? Or, which of you, if you have a child who asks for bread, you're going to give him a stone. Or, which of you, if your child asks for fish, will give a serpent? Now, this makes a little more sense to the people then than it does today because over in the Holy Lands, uh, I, and I've been to the Holy Lands, I've actually seen it because there's several people who still bake the same way. The bread, when it comes out, looks very much like some of the stones in that area. Now let's pretend you're about to eat a meal at nighttime. Uh, they didn't have lights like we have. Uh, they had lamps and it was very low light. If you wanted to play a trick on someone, you would give them a stone instead of bread to eat. 
Or you can just even imagine that there's a stone instead of bread. You wouldn't do that to your child. Now, hold on to that thought. We'll come back to it. The second was a, a fish and a serpent. How did they do their fishing? They fished in the seas and they used nets. They didn't have rods and reels or lures and tackle boxes like we had. They had nets. And they'd throw out those nets and they'd catch the fish. Well, with the nets were also other creatures known as serpents. Some people translate as snakes. And it, if you weren't careful, you could reach in and pick out a serpent, which could hurt, instead of the fish, which would be a benefit. Now, in Luke chapter 11, verse 12, when Luke records the same situation about ask, seek, knock, Jesus, uh, Luke records Jesus saying also uh, uh, an egg and a scorpion. Which of you, if a child asks for an egg, will give a scorpion? Because over in the Holy Lands, there are certain scorpions that will ball up into the ground and look very similar to certain eggs in that area. If a person's not careful, a person could pick up a scorpion which could kill instead of the egg, which would be a benefit. Now, what Jesus is saying is, go ahead, ask, seek, knock. God will answer the prayer. No if, ands, and buts. God will answer the prayer. But God will answer our prayer such that he will not play a trick on us, give us something to hurt, give us something that will kill, instead of only that which would be a benefit. Now, I, I have a daughter, Kristen, who's now 33 years old. When she was about a year and a half, if she wanted something, uh, because she couldn't talk very plainly or knew how to express it, she would just point to it and go, uh, 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 uh. Now, I know a lot of us have children who did that, and a lot of us did it when we were children. That's just a normal communication technique of children. Uh. Well, we were in the kitchen, and uh, she pointed to a cabinet. Uh. I go to the cabinet, I opened it up, and there were several boxes and jars. She pointed like she was pointing to a certain box. So I reached to pick up the box, and you go, uh-uh, uh. And so then I reached to pick up that one, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh, -uh, uh, -uh, uh I just kept pointing. Finally, I pointed to the box she wanted. I picked it up, and the moment I had it in my hands, with both hands, she reached up going, uh-uh, uh, -uh, uh like, I've got to have that. Now, you know what that box was? That box I was holding in my hand that she was wanting was a box of decon rodent poison. Now what kind of father would I be to give her that box simply on the grounds that she was asking, meaning she was asking, seeking, knocking in her own way. If I gave it to her simply because she was asking for it, I, that'd be very cruel, be unwise. I could not even be called a loving father if I did that. So I did what every one of us as parents have done. Let's listen with the third year. What was she really asking for? Well, it was lunchtime. Lunch was not going to be ready for um, a while. So I took her to the refrigerator, got her a snack, but held her over until lunch was going to be ready. Now, Kristen had a need, and she thought her answer to that need was in that box. At that time, I had a lot more wisdom than her. Today, I probably don't know anything, but at least back then, then, I knew a little bit more than her, and I said, no, but I will give you what you really need, and I gave her the snack. Now, if I, an imperfect father, know how to love my child like this, if we, who are imperfect parents, know how to love our children like this, let's put it in terms of the way verse 11 reads. If we, then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give good things to those who ask them? Meaning that, go ahead, ask, seek, knock. God will answer the prayer. But God will love us enough that God will value what we really need and give us what we really need. I've got a friend named Dave who, when he was a little boy, used to pray every night for his teddy bear to come alive. I asked him why he prayed for his teddy bear to come alive. He said, because my, I want that teddy bear to play with me, to walk with me and talk and dance and hug and do all kinds of things with me. I said, well, why are you praying to God about that? 
And he said, because the Bible says, ask and God will give it to me. So I'm asking, I'm seeking, God's going to answer my prayer. Well, a little bit later, we're in high school. And one day, Dave said to me, Skip, God does not exist. I said, why? He said, because if God exists, God would have answered my prayer. But if God does exist, that means God's not all powerful because if God existed and was all powerful, God would have answered my prayer. But if God does exist, and if God is all powerful, that means that God does not love me because if God existed, if God was all powerful, and if God really loved me, God would have made my teddy bear come alive. So I don't want to have anything to do with God anymore. And, and that was the last time he went to church for eons. Well, fast forward several years. I'm now in my first year of seminary. He's in his last year of college, and we're sharing an apartment together. I walked in one day and uh, into the apartment, and Dave was sitting in a chair, had this really weird look on his face, and I was afraid he was on drugs. I said, Dave, are you okay? He said, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. He said, God answered my prayer. Well, I didn't really know that God, that they prayed. And so I said, what prayer? He said, you remember me talking about my praying for a teddy bear to come alive when I was a little kid? At this point, two things happen. One, I go, uh-huh. But the other is I start looking around the room for a teddy bear walking around. He said, I thought at that time I was praying for my teddy bear to come alive. But now what I realize is that I was really praying for a friend. And he said, my parents could not explain during that period of time why, out of the blue, they decided to move from one part of Clarksville to another part. And the part we moved in had children all my age. We rode the bus together. They were in class with me. Dad put a basketball goal up in my backyard. But I didn't play with them. Instead, while they were in the backyard playing ball, I stayed in my room holding on to my teddy bear, pleading for God to make my teddy bear come alive. He said, I had asked for one teddy bear to come alive, and God tried to give me several possible friends. And the tragedy is, we've all grown up, we've all moved away, and I have missed the answer to my prayer because I did not listen to what God was trying to give. I listened to what I wanted to hear and not what God was trying to give me. Well, fast forward about another five years or so, um, about seven, eight years, and uh, I'm now at home. I had just completed surgery on my abdomen area, and I had a spinal anesthetic, which gave me a horrible headache. I'll never have another spinal headache, spinal anesthetic again. And I was lying on the bed trying to recover. The phone rings. Kathy comes into the room and says, Skip, Dave's on the phone. Well, I had to talk to him. So I get up out of the bed, I go to the phone, answer it, and I said, hello? I didn't hear anything. I said, Dave, are you there? And I hear a <laughs> sniffling. I said, Dave, are you okay? He said, Mama's in the hospital at Fort Campbell. She has blood clots all over her body. They're headed to her lung, her heart, her brain. And the doctors don't expect her to live before morning. I said, Dave, that's horrible. He said, I need to be with a friend tonight. I said, oh, Dave. And I, I told him about the surgery and that I couldn't come. And he said, no, Dave. No, he said, Skip, I need to come to you. So I told him how to get to the parsonage. He came. I laid on the couch. He sat in the chair beside me. Man, we talked to the wee hours of the morning. And during the conversation, the, uh, the pain kind of started to go away. We talked about old times. And just before he left, he said, uh, Skip, what I really came for was to ask you to pray for Mama and me. He had never done that before. I said, okay. So I took his hand and I prayed. He cried like a baby for his mom. 
when I finished praying and he composed himself, um, I said, Dave, would you like to pray? He said, yeah, I would. So he prayed. Now, these aren't the exact words, but they're almost the exact words he prayed. He said, God, I know you exist. And I know you're all powerful. And I know you love Mama and me enough that whatever happens tonight, we're going to be okay. And we'll be okay. Well, that was amazing. <laughs> that morning, uh, and he left, and that morning his mother died. But Dave was okay. Now, that was a long time ago, and Dave's had all kinds of ups and downs in life, and amazing things have happened to him. But in one of my conversations with him, he said, it, it's become obvious that many of the things I prayed not to happen really needed to happen. And those things I really wanted to happen later on that didn't happen, I can see that they should not have happened. Which says to all of us, when we pray, listen for God's answer. Like in Garth Brooks' song, Unanswered Prayers, it, he calls them unanswered prayers, but they're really not answers. It's just God said no to something in order to say yes to something far better. So listen for God's answer. Now, one more illustration of this. Uh, John is one of the great pastors, been one of the great pastors in America. He's retired now. And John uh, had a sister growing up who was just always on the edge of a nervous breakdown. Uh, he said that she'd always been mentally struggling as a little child. Now, all the other brothers and sisters were successful, but she was jealous of them because they were all professionals, very successful in their field, and she was a secretary, and she didn't feel that being a secretary was a very good job. I can't live without my secretary. I, I think secretaries are awesome, but that's what she felt. She was one of those who blamed her parents for her being, not being more successful in life and her never marrying. She uh, was one of those abrasive type people that when you talk with them, you, you're kind of glad when you get away. Well, John worked with her. And no matter how much he worked with her, because he has a lot of counseling skills as well as being a great pastor, and no matter how much he worked with her, she was always headed towards a nervous breakdown. So he prayed, family prayed, their churches prayed. They counted about 5,000 people in America at one time who were praying for her. His sister did not have a nervous breakdown. Then during Holy Week of one year, he gets a phone call from where she was working, and the people at work tell him that she's had a nervous breakdown. They put her on a plane with a nurse, fly her to Nashville. He flies from where he is to Nashville, meets her at the airport, takes her to what was called at that time Central State Hospital for people who were mentally ill, and entered her, admitted her. The very thing they prayed not to happen, happened. She had a complete, total nervous breakdown. Well, shortly after that, she began to come out of it. She began to realize she could get along with people a lot better if she was just pleasant, and it was nice to be pleasant. She began to realize she didn't have to have the stress of a professional job. Being a secretary wasn't a bad position. She began to realize that uh, uh, she could appreciate people for all their gifts and graces. And now, now get this, by Thanksgiving of that year, about six months later, she was totally released from the doctor's care. She moved to a different town, got a job as a nurse's aide, is what they were called back then, at the, at the local hospital there. That Christmas, not long after she got there, she went to the hospital Christmas party with a 52-year-old man on a blind date, and he had been an orderly at the hospital, and he had been taking care of his mother for years, and uh, she had just died. Well, the two of them had a romance that developed. The following Thanksgiving, the two were married. So what does John say about this unanswered prayer? He said, my sister is, more, is healthier, more in touch with reality and wholeness than we've ever seen in our lives. 
And, and she says that this proves that God will love our prayers enough that he may deny the form of our request in order to answer the substance. He turned down the answer we thought we needed and he answered in a way that was far better for our sister, far better than we ever dreamed. Which means then, let's go back to the issue. Go ahead, ask, seek, knock. God wants to hear our needs. God wants, in fact, God already knows our needs. So go ahead and tell. Let it out. Let God know what's on your mind. But also, listen for God's answer. Now, sometimes the answers come very quickly. Sometimes they come later. Sometimes much later. And sometimes the answer is no, but this is a better answer. Which means, listen, now, it's a time for rubber to hit the road. What do you need to pray about? What do you need to pray about? Something about your relationships, your marriage, your children, your parents, your, your brother, sister, your school, your grades, your finances, your health. What do you need to worry, pray about? Your job, the church here, your relationship with Christ. What do you need to pray about? God says, bring it on. Come on, pray. I, I will listen. But please, listen for my answer. Listen for my answer. Will you pause and praise with me? Lord, first of all, we thank you for being so powerful, so omniscient such that you can hear every single one of our prayers right now. And Lord, I, I pray a prayer for each of these people here such that they have the grace to, to be patient, to listen for your answer. Lord, I, I pray that you help us learn to just simply sit and listen. But then after we say amen, to begin to listen for the answers that may come through someone else's voice or through the mail or through uh, some other medium, Lord, just help us to be open to your answer and help us to be patient for your answer. Lord Jesus, I pray this in your Son's gracious, loving, holy name. Amen. Amen.